Columbia University Faculty of Science Alumni Association, CAFSA, proudly presents a distinguished speaker series to uplift the knowledge of aspiring students and budding scientists in the Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo and Sri Lanka as well. In this series of lectures, CAFSA features accomplished scientists and key opinion leaders in different science streams to present the advancement in their field of expertise. This seminar series is a collaborative effort between CAFSA and the Columbia University Faculty of Science. Welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series of CAFSA. Welcome everyone to the inaugural talk of the Distinguished Speaker Series organized by Columbia University Faculty of Science Alumni Association of North America. We are, uh, we are going to organize in this event in association with Faculty of Science in the City of Colombo. My name is Sachit Disanayaka, representing the Speaker Series Subcommittee of COPSA. I'll be the moderator for today's talk. Let me tell you a little bit about the objective of this speaker series. We started this speaker series with an objective of further expanding the educational activities of our association. Therefore, we are launching this newest event with the aim of communicating and informing our audiences on various advances of the sciences, technology, and scientific knowledge around the world. The main objective of our CAFSA Distinguished Speaker Series is to reach out a wider audience and increase the awareness of various scientific multidisciplinary topics and advances by inviting eminent researchers, speakers, entrepreneurs to share their experience and expertise. So welcome everyone again. To start this event, first of all, let me cordially invite our current president of CAPSA, Professor Vikram Priya Pereira, to tell you more about CAPSA and this effort. Vikram, uh, you're silent. Uh, yeah, you're muted. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Sachet. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining the inaugural talk by the speaker series of CUFSA North America by Dr. Nalin Samrasinghe. Thank you, Dr. Nalin Samrasinghe for the speech you're going to deliver. Well, it's great to see uh, an audience from Sri Lanka, USA and Canada and around the world. Uh, thank you for joining on this short notice at a time in Kernin for some of you. Uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, you know, we are all living, you know, around the world. So thank you for joining at this inconvenient time. And uh, I'm, yes, uh, uh, I'm Vikram Priya Pereira, the current president of UFSA North America, and I am the third president of uh, the association. Well, uh, CAPSA is now six years old to this month. Yeah. So our mission was to support the uh, Faculty of Science the University of Colombo and Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, of course, we collected and uh, donated uh, Sri Lanka closer to $250,000 during our past six years. Uh, thank you everyone for your support. Yeah, we have a generous and active member group of about 571 individuals. And uh, that's a dedicated group of volunteers and active group of volunteers. And we have 25 members in our executive committee and we appreciate everyone and we appreciate your generosity in time, money and your commitment and skills. Uh, thank you so much. Well, the CUFSA North America was established in April 2016 by Professor Viranga Thilakaratna by initiating, getting together and forming a key group of uh, interested individuals in USA and Canada and with the common and noble objective of helping Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, and Sri Lanka in general. Professor Tilagratna was our first president and the founding president of the association. And uh, it's, uh, he was followed by Dr. Chandana Gunadilika, who was our second president. 
like uh, I was saying earlier, uh, Kapsa is uh, celebrating its sixth year uh, this April, and uh, Kapsa initiated and concluded many projects during our six years. And there are actually several ongoing projects at this point. Just to mention several of our projects that we uh, conducted to help Sri Lanka, and uh, we, uh, you know, we gave equipment, scholarships, and assistance to many, uh, you know, students and you know uh, our uh, core group. So uh, we. Of course, uh, like I was saying, uh, donated closer to $250,000 in all. Uh, to name a few projects that we concluded, uh, you know, past six years, uh, the number one project was the uh, COVID relief fund, you know, so we helped Sri Lanka using uh, closer to like $160,000 uh, and we uh, supported hospitals and uh, all uh, these, you know, uh, you know, medical places with the uh, help of uh, Professor Sonnadar and Professor Mahanam and the science faculty and everyone in the science faculty was a big help. And I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Asoka Ramanayaka, who was uh, one of our key players in Sri Lanka, helped us doing that. And I also want to mention our second uh, most uh, successful project was to donate the 11 inch uh, Celestron telescope to an some accessories to the uh, uh, Department of Physics. Uh, Professor Chandan Jaratna was one of the key players in Sri Lanka, helped us uh, along the way. And uh, thank you also for all your support. And then we gave like two high uh, performance computers to plant science uh, department. And we initiated uh, Professor Valentine Joseph gold medal and scholarship. And uh, Dr. Kirti Premadasa is one of the key players in that uh, from our side to, you know, facilitate all these uh, things, you know. And Dr. Uh, Chandana Gunatilka and Professor uh, uh, Viranga uh, Tilakaratna was also in, uh, you know, key players in these projects. And uh, we also initiated the remote learning project to help uh, uh, during the COVID season to, you know, uh, help students with buying equipment and some technology. So that was another uh, project that we, you know, initiated and concluded. And recently, we actually embarked on our newest project. Uh, about two weeks ago, we initiated that and that's to support Sri Lanka in this time of, uh, you know, uh, urgent need for medical supplies. So that's one of the things that we are, you know, working on. Okay. And uh, then the next thing I want to mention is, uh, please visit our CAPSA website and you can obtain more information about what we are doing currently. And please get involved. Please support us, you know, and we need your help. And uh, we have a group of very active individuals and we thank you all for your support. And it is now my great pleasure to uh, join this event and congratulate our subcommittee uh, by, uh, you know, initiating and organizing this uh, speaker series. Uh, there's many volunteers to lead this project and, uh, you know, uh, I want to uh, point out uh, several of our uh, key speaker series uh, members, uh, Sachit Disanayak, Osha Dharana Singh, Vasundara Fernando, Asha Narivans, and Niranjaka Jairatna. Thank you for a great job. And I also want to thank uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Sumedha Jayastena and uh, Randara Pulukkodi. Uh, they have been uh, uh, instrumental in getting some technical help. And I also thank uh, Professor uh, Sonadar and Professor Chandan Jairatna. Uh, thank you for all your support. Uh, and now uh, let me uh, invite our uh, moderator to take over. Thank you everyone for joining and enjoy the talk. Thank you, Professor Vikram Priya Pereira. Uh -huh. So next, I cordially invite Professor Pulson Nadara, Dean, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, to say a few words about science faculty and association with CAPSA. Thank you, Sajid. Am I audible? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to address you as the Dean of the uh, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, at this uh, inaugural session of the CAPSA speaker series. Uh, if I tell a few things about Faculty of Science, uh, as you know that uh, uh, last year, uh, we actually celebrated uh, 100 years uh, of uh, 
science education in Sri Lanka because uh, if you look at the University of Colombo, uh, we have our roots going back to the uh, es establishment of uh, that time, Ceylon University of College, that was in 1921. Of course, the, that era was quite different. When you read about uh, old documents, you find that uh, basically students were invited uh, uh, to come and join the university from uh, certain families to come and uh, study for uh, Cambridge University exam uh, so that they could actually, uh, they, they were training for the Cambridge uh, exam that time. So uh, we have a rich history. Now, uh, Faculty of Science, of course, uh, established in 1942. But uh, when you think about it, uh, the second faculty, which was established in Peradeniya, that was established uh, even 20 years after establishment of the Faculty of Science at, uh, in uh, uh, where we are now. So that was in 1962. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, 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 we have done a lot of things uh, over the years. So actually, the, those who have been uh, in the university and those who have gone abroad, they have contributed in many ways to the, uh, the development of the Faculty of Science, just like Kupsa is actually now actively engaging with us. And uh, uh, of course, the faculty has evolved quite a bit now. Now we have over 100 PhDs in the faculty. And uh, uh, my student population is around, I believe, around 2,500 undergraduates. And we have uh, uh, master's students, about uh, 300 master's students. And we have uh, MPhils and uh, PhD students, about 150 now in the faculty. So faculty is growing. And uh, uh, if I uh, tell a few things about the uh, uh, relationship with the Kupsa we are having, uh, of course, last two years, uh, we were having uh, quite difficult time because of uh, COVID. So Kupsa was the, our main partner, actually, to get out from the situation, because uh, th there are certain things we could not handle with the government funds. Now, uh, if you look at the Columbia University, we are getting students from all over the country. And uh, some of the bright students are actually coming from very disadvantaged families. So Kupsa was always with, with us. So anytime when we wanted to help a student, uh, they, they were ready to help. So I'm. Uh, Actually, I, I, we are privileged to work with Kupsa, and uh, I'm, I really appreciate uh, the help given by Kupsa. Uh, I can, if I tell a few things, like uh, we got a large number of laptops, I think uh, close to 25 laptops uh, we have given to students already, and uh, we have uh, various uh, uh, scholarship programs with Kupsa helping the student even today. And uh, so those things actually helped us during this difficult time to help the student to uh, uh, get a proper education. And uh, I'm sure that we will work with Kupsa in the years to come, and uh, uh, it will be a great help for us. So uh, if I, uh, uh, I think basically, uh, those are the few things I want to mention. Just before concluding, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Nalin Samrasinghe. Uh, Nalin is actually a, a long time friend of mine. We have been friends for a quite a long time. And uh, uh, naming the University of Colombo name given to this asteroid, we really appreciate it, Nalin. And it is something that uh, normally we cannot even imagine. So it's your discovery, uh, but uh, you, have, you have been humble enough to actually do it for us. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, let me uh, 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 stop here. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nadare. Before moving on to introducing the speaker, let me tell you about the Q&A session we'll be having at the end of the talk. So we will be, at the end of the talk, we'll be having a 15 minute uh, Q&A session. So please type your questions in Zoom chat window or YouTube live streaming comment section. So I just want to remind you that no need to wait until the end, uh, share your question during the talk anytime via this, uh, either of these methods. Uh, next, I call it Cordial Invite, uh, uh, founding president of COPSA, Professor Viranga Tilakaratna, to introduce the speaker for today's talk. Thank you, Sanjit. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, hear. Yes, we can hear. Oh, you. Thank you, Sanjit. Uh, Sanjit uh, 
Yeah, we are very fortunate to have a world-recognized astronomer to give the inaugural talk of the speaker series organized by COPSA in association with the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. As a former Dean of the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, it is with great pleasure that I introduce one of our own alumni, Dr. Nalin H. Samarasinghe as a speaker today. Dr. Samarasinghe is a product of the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. He received the BSc special degree in physics with first class honors from the University of Colombo. And then he went on to receive the MS and PhD degrees in astronomy from the University of Maryland, USA. He currently works as a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Arizona, USA. Dr. Samarsingh studies small bodies of the solar system, focusing mainly on comets. He has studied many comets, including the most famous of them all, the Comet Halley, or more popularly known as Halley's Comet. He has also studied other robotic spacecraft targets, like comets Borrelli, Temple 1, and Hartley 2, as well as the brightest comet of the 1990s, Comet Hale Bob. In recognition of his contribution to comet science, the International Astronomical Society Union in 2002 named the asteroid number 12871 after Dr. Samar Singer. It was named Samar Singer. And Dr. Samar Singer is the co discoverer of the asteroid number 607372, which he has named Colombo Lanka to honor and also as a mark of gratitude to his alma mater, the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Despite his very busy professional career, Dr. Thomasinghe has been extremely generous in his giving his time to benefit his alma mater. To main, uh, main, uh, name a, a few of them, uh, particularly noteworthy are the leading role he played in the project sponsored by CAPSA to donate a state-of-the-art telescope to the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, and also his work as an external advisor to several, several students doing postgraduate studies in the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. And it is with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Samar Singh to talk to us about the discovery of the asteroid Colombo Unilanka and also about the contribution to astronomy by the University of Colombo. Over to you, Nalin. Um, thank you, Dr. Dilakaratna. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Can you see it? Uh, yes, Professor Samasinga. We can see okay. you and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, first, um, I would like to thank Kafsa and uh, Faculty of Science for inviting me to present this uh, inaugural lecture of the speaker series. Uh, I warmly welcome um, current and former members of the University of Colombo family and all other participants joining via Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook. So this is the official citation for naming the asteroid. It's uh, short and sweet. <laughs> um, and uh, first, um, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Beatrice Muller and uh, Dr. Todd Lauer. Without their help, Beatrice for being the uh, principal investigator of the observing proposal. I was the co-I uh, and uh, Todd for helping me at the telescope. Uh, I might not have had the opportunity to discover or name Colombo Unilang. Uh, for me, it was a long journey. And I like to thank multiple people, starting with my parents who provided a nurturing environment and my father for providing a setting that encouraged me to develop an inquisitive and analytical mindset. Then I had excellent teachers, first at Hena Vidyalaya Mount Lavinia, and then at Nalanda College, Colombo, especially science and math teachers, for planting the seeds that helped me to develop critical thinking skills. 
uh, which is uh, very much in need. Uh, uh, my teachers at the University of Colombo further aided in laying a solid physics and math foundation for my career. Finally, I was fortunate to have had an excellent PhD advisor and an out of the box thinking postdoctoral mentor, both of whom were internationally recognized PAMAT experts. Uh, so uh, many of my uh, teachers at uh, University of Colombo were influential in my professional development. Representative of them, I would like to consider late Professor M.L.T. Kannangara of physics and late Professor V.K. Samarnayak of mathematics as the most notable among them. Uh, Professor Kannangara instilled the relevance of physical intuition and what it needs to be a physicist. And Professor Samarnayak introduced me to the basics of computing, uh, 1477 in uh, those days. Remember computers, even mainframe computers were a novelty uh, in those days over 40 years back. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to have had an excellent, uh, inspiring crop of teachers at the university, but I regret I cannot mention all of them by name in the interest of time. This naming of asteroid Colombo Unilanka is a tribute to all of you. Also, I hope this is an inspiration to the next generation of students. Be focused and persevere. You will succeed. Um, I think it is appropriate that the naming of the asteroid happened at the same time as the university completed its centennial celebrations. Now, next, uh, uh, I would like to tell something about the term terminology that I'm going to use. Uh, modern professional astronomers are essentially astrophysicists as they apply physics to understand astronomical observations and phenomena. Therefore, in this talk, I may use the terms astronomers and astrophysicists or astronomy and astrophysics interchangeably, depending on the context. But for all practical purposes, they mean the same. Next to the outline of the talk, uh, first I will start with a brief introduction to asteroids and then talk about the discovery and the properties of the asteroid Colombo Unilanka. After that, I will talk about the collective contribution to astronomy made by University of Colombo alumni, academic staff, and students. So uh, continuing on, before talking about asteroids, uh, uh, I want to talk a bit on the formation of the solar system. Uh, so as the top left picture shows uh, our solar system started with the collapse of a huge gas cloud and the collapse was prompted by an external trigger such as a, a nearby supernova or a, a passing star. Then that gas cloud as it uh, collapsing uh, started rotating faster and faster and it got uh, flattened. So if you look at physics uh, basically this phenomenon can be explained using the conservation of angular momentum. Uh, when the gas cloud or the solar nebula is rotating faster and faster, it started forming planetesimals, first uh, like uh, small pebble size uh, objects, and then ultimately protoplanets, which ultimately became planets. And finally, we ended up with a newly formed solar system. So uh, continuing on, uh, uh, the asteroids, we also call them uh, minor planets, are small uh, inner planet uh, objects, uh, small objects, rocky objects in the inner solar system are a category of objects left over from the uh, formation time of the solar system uh, about 4.6 billion years ago. They acted as some building blocks for rocky planets, including Earth. On the other hand, uh, comets, uh, icy objects in the outer part of the solar system are a category of objects left over from the formation time of the solar system. They provided some building blocks for giant planets, uh, giant planets like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, I said some because uh, 
uh, there were pebble sized objects and uh, uh, solar nebula gas also made a contribution. And uh, I want to uh, uh, mention something. When I say the solar system was 4.6 billion years ago, billion is a big number. We all know it is one followed by nine zeros. And if you talk million, one followed by six zeros. But uh, sometimes we cannot uh, really visualize them. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, consider a, a ping pong ball, a table tennis ball, which is uh, four centimeters diameter. And uh, if you line uh, uh, one ping pong ball against another, and if you have them all the way from University of Colombo to Paluthara along the Gaul Road, you will need million ping pong balls. That is how much is million. And on the other hand, a billion, uh, you can put the same billion bi uh, ping pong balls uh, along Earth's equator and uh, uh, touching each other. And you will need billion uh, ping pong balls. So billion is that much uh, larger. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, 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 always it is nice to see some pictures of asteroids. We have visited a few asteroids uh, and some are shown below. And uh, all, for, uh, all asteroids that I'm showing you here, uh, they are comparable in size to uh, Colombo Unilanka. Actually, the top left one, uh, Ida is uh, bigger than uh, Colombo Unilanka, and uh, that was the second asteroid to be visited. And uh, it has a moon, Dactyl, and then uh, uh, asteroid Raigu, uh, a Japanese mission went to it, and uh, then uh, uh, asteroid uh, Itokawa. Uh, and uh, on the bottom left is asteroid Bennu. So we are bringing in samples. Actually, we already brought in samples from uh, uh, Itokawa, uh, uh, from uh, Raigu, Itokawa, and Bennu. We are bringing in uh, uh, samples from the surface. And one thing I want to point out is uh, the asteroids come in different shapes and sizes. So where are they? Uh, asteroids are in the main asteroid belt between planets and planets Mars and Jupiter. Uh, the asteroids that come close to Earth are called near Earth asteroids or NEAs. So this is a, a diagram showing uh, the asteroids, uh, most of the asteroids in our solar system. Uh, the outer circle here is the orbit of Jupiter. Jupiter is here. Uh, and uh, then uh, shown in yellow are, uh, by yellow dots are asteroids. So this is the main asteroid belt and uh, interior to it, uh, orbits of Mars and in blue shows the uh, orbit of Earth and then Venus and uh, Mercury. And at the center, you have the sun and the V-shaped objects are uh, comets. And uh, one thing I want to point out, uh, most of the asteroids are in the asteroid belt. However, uh, along the orbit of uh, Jupiter, in front of Jupiter and behind Jupiter, but by about 60 degrees, there are two clumps of asteroids. They are called Jupiter Trojans. Uh, so in fact, uh, uh, currently there's a mission called Lucy, which will visit uh, these Jupiter Trojans. So how many asteroids are discovered so far? The first asteroid Ceres was discovered in 1801, uh, over 200 years back. Now we have observations of over 1 million asteroids and uh, nearly half uh, are numbered. Uh, that means the asteroids are numbered only when their orbits are accurately known. And the, an asteroid can be named only its 
that particular asteroid is numbered. And only 4% of the numbered asteroids are named. And Colombo Unilanka is one of them. And uh, talking about asteroids in the main asteroid belt, uh, uh, they are not uniformly distributed. So this is a plot of number of asteroids in the y-axis. In the x-axis, the distance from the sun. So, uh, so this is basically covering the asteroid belt. And there are these big gaps. Uh, they are called Kirkwood gaps. And these gaps happen to be at places which we call mean motion resonances. That means, for example, if you take uh, this three to one resonance, if there is an object there, that asteroid will go around the sun three times when Jupiter goes around the sun only once. So uh, they are uh, unstable uh, uh, for any asteroid to be in that uh, resonance. So uh, that is how uh, these Kirkwood gaps were formed. Uh, uh, resonances uh, are very important when you are studying the solar system architecture or even uh, planets around other stars. Some resonances are unstable, some are stable, but I'm not going to go into details. So why asteroids are relevant? They allow us to study the early solar system during its formation. And uh, uh, they brought in a portion of the water we have on Earth. Uh, and they changed the evolutionary path of life on Earth. Remember dinosaurs? Uh, dinosaurs got extinct as a result of an asteroid impact. Fortunately, uh, large asteroid impacts are extremely rare. Um, and uh, so uh, we don't have uh, uh, mass scale uh, uh, events such as that uh, frequently. In the future, asteroids could provide resources such as precious metals to us. And also in the future, they could provide various resources such as water necessary for interplanetary travel. Now uh, coming to asteroid Colombo Unilanka, uh, I will talk on the discovery and naming of the asteroid Colombo Unilanka. It was discovered on uh, November 30th, uh, 2000. So almost uh, close to 22 years back at the Kitt Peak National Observatory uh, in uh, Southern Arizona by myself and Dr. Todd Lauer. And uh, uh, when we discovered that, it was given the provisional designation 2000WU178. The letter W means uh, uh, it was discovered during the second half of the month, November. And uh, after there were enough observations by multiple people, mostly by sky surveys, uh, which scanned the sky for asteroids, uh, uh, it got numbered in early this year. Uh, as uh, asteroid number 607372. And uh, then uh, I proposed Colombo Unilanka as the name, and it got accepted on March 21st of this year. Uh, naming of asteroids are subject to strict rules and guidelines, and uh, we followed the same rules. And uh, uh, rules are set by the International Astronomical Union. And uh, one thing I want to point out is discovery probability uh, by non-sky surveys of asteroids, by non-sky surveys is less than 1% uh, when we discovered the asteroid. And now it is very much less than 1%. Uh, and also uh, discovery of Colombo Unilanka was serendipitous. Uh, and uh, uh, how do we discover? Uh, asteroids. Uh, at least when we discovered, we discovered by comparing images taken at different times, but of the same part of the sky. I have a video, but if I have time, uh, I'm happy to show you at the end. And uh, the physical properties of the asteroid, uh, uh, its uh, absolute magnitude, uh, which is the measure of its brightness, is 17.6, so we know its brightness. 
but we don't know its albedo. That means uh, how effectively it would reflect it, uh, the sunlight. So because of that, we can't exactly estimate its uh, size. Uh, its size should be in the one to two kilometer range. If the albedo is 10%, that means uh, or 0.1, uh, its uh, diameter should be 1.3 kilometers. And if it is 1.3 kilometers, that means its surface area is about five kilometers. Uh, its shape is not known uh, and its rotation state is unknown. And uh, it's, however, its orbital properties are uh, very well known. That is when the asteroid uh, will be numbered. Uh, so the average distance from the sun is 2.6 astronomical unit. Astronomical unit is 150 million, 150 million kilometers. Uh, uh, astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the earth. And uh, so it's average distance from the sun to Columbia Unilanka is 2.6 astronomical units. And uh, it's, uh, Orbit is almost a circle, but uh, it is little uh, elliptical. And uh, we measure that use in the quantity called eccentricity and the eccentricity is 0 0.08. That means it is almost close to a circle. And uh, the orbit uh, of uh, Columbo Unilanka is inclined by eight degrees to the ecliptic plane. Ecliptic plane is the plane where Earth moves around the sun. And its orbital period is 4.2 years. So it takes uh, 4.2 years to go around the sun once. And uh, its minimum orbit intersection distance, that means the closest it can get to Earth is 1.4 astronomical unit. So that corresponded to more than 200 million kilometers. So there is no danger of it hitting Earth. Uh, the next, uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk on the contribution to astronomy uh, made by uh, Colombo University. So uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, uh, I will talk on the contributions made by Colombo university alumni, academic staff, and students. I mention individual contributions only to highlight and emphasize the extensive collective output made by University of Colombo to astronomy. I will focus on three aspects of the contribution to astronomy made by University of Colombo. The three aspects are research, education, and public outreach. First, I'm going to talk on astronomy research. Typically, the number of peer-reviewed publication measures the research productivity, and I will list contribution made by different scientists associated with the University of Colombo in advancing our understanding of the cosmos. Uh, I'm going to show a list based on the NASA Astrophysics Data System, uh, which is also called ADS for short, uh, for peer-reviewed publications. They are accessible, anybody can access at NASA ADS by uh, looking at the website. Uh, one can do the Google search for NASA ADS. Please make sure you enter the correct spelling of the last name of the scientist you are looking for. And then you can see uh, the contribution by each of them. Uh, please note that ADS covers all the major astronomy journals uh, worldwide. I will start listing scientists who have had a few hundred, more than, more than 100 publications and stop at a natural break for the number of publications. Uh, I want to point out, like exams, the number of publications is not a perfect measure. For example, senior scientists and scientists who are involved in large collaborations have more publications. So younger colleagues will have less publications. Uh, despite all these, Still peer-reviewed publications provide an accepted measure of the research productivity. In compiling this list, uh, I carried out my own investigations, but if there are any omissions, and I, I, I spoke to a number of uh, colleagues too, uh, but if there are any omissions, 
I take the full responsibility and I apologize in advance. Furthermore, the list covers only astronomy publications, but not affiliated fields such as uh, spacecraft instrumentation for space missions to planets or other astrophysics uh, uh, missions. So the list uh, starts with um, uh, Dr. Chandra Vikramasinghe. Uh, uh, during the last three or four decades, he was uh, concentrating on uh, cometary spans for me. I will, I will mention, uh, describe what it is. Uh, before that, he was uh, uh, working on interstellar dust grains. Uh, panspermia is the idea that uh, life originated elsewhere and reached Earth. Life did not originate on Earth. And cometary panspermia means comets brought life from elsewhere. And uh, of course, some people ask, uh, uh, is that what happened? We don't know for sure right now. Maybe in another two or three decades when we have uh, a sample uh, from, uh, from the surface of a comet or uh, ideally uh, subsurface material from a comet, uh, then we can uh, know more about it. And uh, second in the list is Dr. Dial Vikramasinghe. As I understand, uh, uh, Dial spent uh, one year at uh, University of Colombo. He's uh, uh, Dr. Chandra Vikramasinghe's younger brother. Um, he studies white dwarfs and pulsars. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Asoka Mendes. Uh, uh, Dr. Mendes is a, a pioneer in the field of dusty space plasma physics uh, and its astrophysical applications. He has studied comets and uh, also he was uh, involved in uh, uh, space missions to Comet Halley in the 1980s. Uh, I want to mention a, so, a small uh, story here. Uh, my first international conference was in 1986, uh, basically to synthesize uh, the results from the space missions and ground-based observations, uh, and of course, theoretical work too. And uh, 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 the conference uh, summary was given by the conference organizers selected Dr. Asoka Mendes to give the conference summary. So that is, uh, uh, that is evidence of the respect that he commands in the field. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ganesh Chanmugam. Uh, he passed away uh, about uh, around 2000, I believe. Um, uh, he studied white dwarfs and neutron stars and uh, asteroid Chanmugam is named after him. And uh, next it's me. Uh, I mainly study comets. Uh, next we have Dr. Kavan Ratnatunga. Uh, he studied galactic and extragalactic astronomy, uh, gravitational lenses, and uh, he was uh, studying, uh, analyzing uh, Hubble Space Telescope images, uh, uh, many Hubble Space Telescope images uh, in his career. Then we have Dr. Udara Besekar. Uh, 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 he is an expert on high energy astrophysics and gamma ray birds. Uh, also, Dr. Tilan Upwat, he also has studied uh, uh, high energy astrophysics and gamma ray birds. Uh, Dr. Tilina Dayanga, uh, he was studying gravitational waves and he was involved in the LIGO experiment to uh, detect uh, gravitational waves. Uh, next uh, in the list, continuing on, uh, Dr. Tilak Hewaga. Uh, uh, Tilak has multiple interests, infrared astronomy, solar physics, planetary atmospheres, COBE uh, mission, which was a cosmology mission, and Dixie. Uh, and also he was he's in, involved in instrument astronomical instrumentation. Uh, um, I, I want to uh, mention that uh, um, Dr. Hewa Gama is the first Sri Lankan origin astronomer uh, to be a NASA civil servant. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he is the only one so far. Uh, Sri Lankan origin astronomer 
who is a NASA civil servant. I just want to uh, uh, emphasize there are other Sri Lankan origin scientists working in at NASA. So uh, also, uh, especially for the uh, students uh, at the university or universities, uh, I want to point out something. And I, uh, I asked Dr. Hewagama uh, and received his permission. Um, Dr. Hewagama uh, did a general degree. And uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say with this example is, uh, do not get discouraged if you did not get selected to do a special degree. Uh, you still have opportunities. Uh, persevere, uh, focus on what you want to achieve. You will succeed. And next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Rohane Elessar Vijayvardhana. Uh, he's a, a theoretical physicist working on quantum field theory, uh, particle physics, and uh, their application to astrophysics. So actually, astrophysics is not his main area, but uh, he had uh, uh, still a large number of uh, uh, astrophysics uh, uh, papers. So that is why he's in this list. And I consider uh, LSR to be uh, one of the best theoretical physicists that Sri Lanka has produced. Uh, uh, and again, a, a short story. Um, uh, once I went to a conference and uh, I met a colleague uh, from uh, uh, the same institution as uh, uh, Dr. Vijayavadana. And so I mentioned about LSR to the colleague and colleague's uh, reply was, we treat him like gold. So that is the respect that he commands. Uh, next, we have Dr. Suranga Ruhunusiri. He's a plasma physicist uh, uh, and uh, studies uh, application of plasma uh, on uh, astrophysical context. Uh, he was involved in the Maven mission to Mars and uh, he has applied uh, plasma physics to comets too. Then uh, going into the radio astronomy side, uh, uh, Dr. Bennett G. Bhakti Pereira, uh, he studies pulsars and he's a radio astronomer. Uh, he's uh, uh, in Arecibo, he's at Arecibo. Then uh, Dr. Shantari Alvis, uh, who is a uh, theoretical physicist, uh, a cosmologist. Uh, he studies cosmology, including string theory. Uh, and then we have Dr. Nipuni Palliaguru. Uh, and uh, Dr. Palliaguru uh, also studied uh, gravitational waves and involved in the LIGO experiment. Uh, and uh, she also had a stint at uh, Arecibo. Uh, continuing on, we have uh, Dr. Prasanna Deshapriya. Asteroid Deshapriya is named after uh, him. Uh, he, he was involved in um, uh, Rosetta mission to Comet Cherimoy Gerasimenko and the Osiris Rex mission to uh, uh, asteroid Bennu, uh, which will bring a sample from the, that, uh, the mission collected from the surface. Then uh, we have let uh, Dr. Jeeva Anandan, uh, a theoretical physicist uh, uh, who was uh, doing uh, general relativity. Uh, 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 and then uh, Dr. Murugesupille Maheshwaran, uh, he worked on stellar magnetic fields. Uh, then uh, uh, Dr. Kirti Tenakon, again, a theoretical physicist with varied interest, a Renaissance man. I would say, uh, and uh, at this time, uh, I had to uh, stop this list because uh, uh, there are at least 15, uh, 19 scientists I mentioned, but uh, I'm sure there are at least 15 more scientists, uh, but uh, I had to stop because uh, I already, as I mentioned, uh, I mentioned 19 scientists, and there is a natural break in the number of publication at this point. And also I feel I may miss many colleagues, especially those who are new to the field. But uh, 
Uh, anyway, as you see from this list, the expertise of the individuals in this list varies from solar system astronomy to galactic astronomy and then extragalactic astronomy to cosmology. Also, you may have noticed that the expertise range from theoretical work to observational to instrumentation. A wide span of expertise and contributions covering a huge range indeed. Next, uh, I will uh, concentrate on astronomy uh, education. University of Columbia has a long history of teaching astronomy as a regular course going back to at least late 1950s. First at the mathematics department and now at the physics department. Uh, so I'm limiting this discussion only to astronomy education uh, carried out in Sri Lanka at the university level. So uh, Professor Douglas Samarasekar taught an uh, astronomy uh, course uh, under, at the math department in late 50s. And Dr. Asoka Mendes, uh, uh, who took this class, told me that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, astronomy was one of the subjects uh, in the final year exam. And then uh, in the late 1960s, after his PhD, Dr. Asoka Mendes taught for a few years uh, an astrophysics course. And then uh, in late 1970s, uh, 1979, uh, if my memory is right, to be specific, uh, uh, Dr. Nalini Silva started an astrophysics course. And um, I personally like to thank both, both Dr. Nalini Silva and Dr. Appa Singh as the head of the mathematics department at that time for decide to offer this course. I was one of those who petitioned to start this course and I was one who uh, took the course. And then um, Dr. Chandana Jayaratna uh, in 2005 started an astronomy course uh, in the physics department. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Chandana Jayaratna uh, is, has given uh, astronomy lectures as coursework at the Open University and uh, also uh, Dr. Jayaratna has uh, established the Astronomy and Space Science Unit uh, in the Department of Physics. Uh, at this time, I would like to mention, it, this is my personal opinion, the most significant uh, success stories associated with this unit uh, that it, uh, are the uh, first locally awarded uh, astronomy PhD to Mr. Janaka Surya, now Dr. Surya. Uh, and uh, the discovery of exoplanet using Kepler mission data by Mr. M Mr. Mahesh Hera, uh, who is right now pursuing a PhD in Canada. So um, then uh, continuing on astronomy education, uh, uh, Mr. Saraj Gunasekara and uh, uh, Janaka Das Surya uh, both uh, supervise number of undergraduate projects uh, uh, and uh, then uh, Dr. Upali Karnasiri, Dr. Kavan Ratnatunga, and late Dr. Hilarion Kodipili, Kodipili uh, they gave astronomy lectures as part of coursework at University of Peradeniya, University of Moratua, and University of Colombo, respectively. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, mention something about the Molesworth Telescope. Uh, uh, Molesworth telescope uh, was housed at the dome on the university grounds uh, and Dr. V.K. Samarnaika took the leadership for the restoration of the Molesworth telescope around 1970. The reason was the telescope got damaged during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, in the 19, early 1970 only, they were successful in restoration. Uh, so uh, Dr. Samarayaka with the involvement of many others brought the telescope to working condition and observations were carried out until the theft of metallic parts in the late 1980s. Um, next, we will look at astronomy public outreach. Uh, that is communicating uh, astronomy to the wider population. Uh, sharing the wonders of the universe is something inspiring to many students and also enjoyed by adults. Again, University of Colombo has a long history related to popularization of astronomy. Uh, 
If I missed any individual, please accept my apologies in advance. And what is listed cover only a summary of activities conducted in Sri Lanka. So I will start with uh, uh, Professor Samar Nayaka. Uh, in the mid 60s, he had a uh, popular astronomy book uh, for the Sinhala uh, uh, audience, Mulika um, Taraka Vidyava. Uh, and then um, uh, Dr. Chandana Jayaratna uh, was uh, the coordinator for Astronomy and Astrophysics Olympiad, which was uh, uh, very instrumental in uh, making astronomy uh, popular among school kids. He was also the coordinator for Junior Astronomy Olympiad, and uh, he has multiple popular astronomy books, uh, mostly in Singhala. And um, uh, he has conducted uh, 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 star parties or star events, as some people call, uh, for popularization of astronomy in Sri Lanka. And continuing on, um, uh, Mr. Saraj Gunasekara and uh, uh, Janakada Surya, uh, they were also involved in popularization of astronomy and uh, they held uh, workshops at Arthur C. Clarke Center. And finally, um, I want to mention um, uh, Dr. Sarad Gunapala at uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, He's also involved in popularization of astronomy uh, because JPL or NASA's uh, mission is uh, space exploration. And uh, so uh, he was talking about, uh, especially about NASA missions to other planets. So um, there are a lot of uh, people uh, uh, involved in uh, public outreach and there are many others, probably over 100 including current and past students in the popularization of astronomy. I like to point out that the active participation of students and initiatives by students are essential for successful outreach activities. Uh, whether it is the mathematical and astronomical society in the past or astronomical society at present, or the students for the exploration and development of space or whatever other organization. So, uh, uh, in conclusion, I think it is clear from this evidence that uh, University of Colombo has produced many scientists who have helped advance our understanding of the cosmos. They also actively involved in the education and public outreach of astronomy, so a wider audience can enjoy the wonders of the sky. Therefore, an asteroid to be named after University of Colombo, as it concludes its centennial celebrations, is fully justified in my opinion, and it is an honor that I was able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Samra Singha. Uh, it was a very nice talk, and uh, um, uh, so let's move on to the Q&A session. <clears throat> so for the audience, I'd like to remind again that you can type your questions in uh, Zoom chat window or YouTube live streaming. You can uh, type your question in the comment section. So we have... Uh, quite a number of questions actually uh, to Dr. Nali Samara Singha. Um, so, okay, let me start with something. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, okay, uh, uh, Rishan Fernando uh, uh, asked this question. So we sometimes hear that the asteroid can impact the earth and lead to destruction of the earth. Considering there are thousands of asteroids, is there any monitoring and warning system exist for such events? Uh, yes. Um, um, in fact, uh, uh, first of all, I should mention that uh, the uh, most uh, danger is from asteroid larger than one kilometer or more. For example, the event which uh, uh, ultimately result in uh, extinction of dinosaurs, uh, not as 
the impact itself, not at the moment, but uh, as consequence of the impact. Uh, uh, extinction of dinosaurs, uh, that was about a 10 kilometer size object. Um, so uh, we know most of, probably close to 95% of the uh, uh, one kilometer or larger asteroids. Uh, so they are uh, all known. And uh, uh, then uh, right now, uh, NASA has uh, mandated, was mandated by the US Congress to look and identify all objects 300 meters or larger. And uh, so uh, there are a lot of them still to be discovered. But, uh, uh, but uh, all the big, most of the big ones uh, we know, and also uh, uh, that is with respect to asteroids. Then, then of course, if there is a comet which comes all the way from uh, outer reaches of the solar system, we, a comet which we do not know about. Uh, potentially that could have an impact with Earth. But again, the chances are very, very small as far as a huge impacts are concerned. But small objects like the house size object or meter size objects, uh, yes, they are, they, are, they are pretty common. Uh, and uh, uh, the monitorings are going on, but uh, sometimes, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in Sudan, a uh, few years back, there was a, a meteorite fell, uh, which we did not know beforehand. Uh, so uh, a large one, uh, but uh, uh, there are various programs to uh, find out uh, uh, the impacts. Thank you, Professor Amrasinghe. There are uh, actually another like one, two, three, four questions. Uh, so let's uh, try to answer that also. Uh, so let us let me start with uh, like an uh, easier one. So what is the classification to separate asteroid and planets? So the Professor Sonadara and also Professor Thirakaratna uh, uh, extend that uh, question uh, from Professor Sonadara can you go into classification of all solar objects such as planets, asteroids, moons, solar dust, et cetera? Um, yeah, uh, if, you, if you take a moon, uh, moon will orbit a planet or an asteroid. That means uh, uh, in addition to it going around the sun, uh, uh, a moon will orbit another object other than the sun. So uh, that is easy. And uh, then uh, how to draw the line between an asteroid and a planet? That is a tricky question uh, because uh, the largest asteroid, uh, Ceres, is also considered a dwarf planet. So uh, uh, it's like, uh, how do you uh, separate uh, oceans? or uh, different seas on Earth. So there is a certain amount of subjectivity. And um, you may have heard about uh, uh, Pluto being uh, 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 demoted, I'm using with <laughs> quotation marks, uh, from a planet status to a dual planet status. So uh, all these are uh, subjective uh, definitions. Uh, because if you look at Pluto from a geological point of view, uh, it is more like a planet. But from a dynamics point of view, Pluto is not a planet because uh, its orbit is affected by the orbit of Neptune. It is in what is called two to three uh, uh, resonance with uh, Neptune. That means when Neptune goes around the sun three times, Pluto goes around the sun twice. So, um, so uh, some objects we can um, uh, we can have clear definitions, but uh, 
Others, the definitions are somewhat subjective. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that answer. Um, so let me read the next question. This is from Angela Gunasekara. Hi, Nalina. Has the samples taken from other asteroid uh, lead to any discoveries of uh, rare earth metals? What is your feeling about metallic focusing on rare earth metals contents, uh, content of uh, asteroids? Um, we know, uh, actually, uh, we know about uh, various metals uh, from spectroscopic observations done from Earth. Uh, and uh, the samples, uh, they are primarily used to uh, measure chemical compositions and also uh, to understand uh, the formation of the objects and to find out the differences between different uh, asteroids. So in that sense, uh, uh, there was not much uh, uh, focus being on uh, uh, the rare earth uh, metals, but uh, uh, but I know there are companies uh, which are uh, planning on uh, doing asteroid mining. Uh, so uh, I guess. Uh, Maybe in few decades time, that would be a reality. Okay, thank you. Um, let me move on to the next one. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on to a question about the Colombia in Sri Lanka. This is from Dula Siri Amara Siri Vardhana. Have you categorized the chemical signature of this Colombia in Sri Lanka asteroid? Is it M? C or S type asteroid? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the problem is uh, we don't have any spectroscopic observations to uh, classify uh, or identify its uh, spectral type. Uh, so um, I, I will uh, briefly mention uh, uh, the uh, C and S type asteroid. S means like mostly rocky and C means more like uh, carbonaceous uh, kind. Uh, rocky ones are more common uh, in the uh, inner part of the asteroid belt. And uh, when you go towards the outer part, uh, it is uh, mostly, uh, not all, uh, dominated by carbonaceous one and M stand for metallic ones, uh, mostly. Uh, but uh, there are other spectral types too. But the problem is this is uh, this particular object is uh, in the middle of uh, uh, the main asteroid belt. So, in fact, uh, I looked at uh, whether I could even uh, guess, uh, but uh, uh, I don't want to even uh, <laughs> guess what it is uh, without having a spectrum. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I hope we can continue a little bit more. Uh, 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 I hope everyone is interested in some of the questions, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, since sure. this is also on uh, YouTube uh, live, maybe we can continue so that uh, we can answer some of the questions. Sure. Uh, so Sumedha Jayasena asked about, Nalin mentioned asteroid uh, provide fuel such as water in the interplanetary travel. Can, he, uh, can you elaborate that? Uh, yeah, um, because uh, right now uh, water is not used as a fuel, but uh, uh, in the future, uh, especially when we are looking at uh, uh, other modes of uh, 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 fuel, uh, it is very likely water could be used as a uh, fuel and uh, the concept studies are uh, already undertaken by different people. Um, so uh, the, the thing is, uh, if water can be used as a fuel, um, the advantage is uh, there will be no 
contamination, so to speak. So that is the main advantage. This question is from uh, O'Neill Pereira. Uh, asteroid belt indicates a large group of asteroids. Does that mean all of those are just calculated to be present um, based on gravitational attractions, etc.? Since only a few are numbered, indicating the parts are not verified. Uh, uh, that that is true. Only about uh, twenty thousand plus asteroids are named, but uh, over 600,000 asteroids are numbered. So uh, we, we know the orbits of over 600,000 asteroids and uh, maybe an, uh, close to equal number, uh, we know something about their orbits, uh, mm -hmm. even though the orbits, uh, orbital parameters are not very well established. So uh, ha, uh, knowing 600,000 orbits, that is sufficient to uh, uh, tell there are more asteroids uh, in the asteroid belt. Okay, thank you very much. Tilan uh, Hevage uh, asked a question. Uh, there is a talk about increasing number of solar flares these days. Is that really the case? And if so, what is the contribution to global warming? It's a different question, but uh, I thought maybe- we uh, Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not a uh, space scientist per se. Uh, uh, solar flares uh, have an effect on earth. Uh, more than uh, global warming, it will have uh, more impact uh, on uh, Earth's magnetic field and uh, uh, the satellites going around Earth. Uh, a lot of technologies will depend on the satellites, uh, including our GPS system and uh, communication. So uh, they could get affected with uh, uh, increased solar activity. Uh, so. Uh, the, depending on the solar cycle and if there are uh, uh, solar flares, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's try to answer a few questions. Uh, so from Chandana Gulatilika, there was a recent news item saying that meteoroids could have brought all five genetic letters of DNA to early Earth. What does that say about the possibility of life on Earth originating from outer space? Um, yeah, that is what I said. Uh, 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 when we are talking about uh, uh, meteorites, uh, uh, almost all meteorites are of asteroid origin. Uh, uh, so we have found uh, complex carbonic molecules uh, uh, components, uh, mo uh, molecules, uh, but uh, uh, saying that life came from uh, elsewhere to Earth need more evidence. So that evidence, I think we do not have right now. Uh, so it could be uh, life started on Earth, as most people think, uh, or it could be brought from somewhere else. But uh, as far as uh, uh, planetary uh, panspermia is, uh, the cometary panspermia is concerned, um, I think uh, when we have uh, uh, cometary samples from the surface, and the subsurface uh, one day, uh, uh, having multiple samples, uh, that will tell us uh, uh, whether that is a plausible mechanism, uh, whether there is life elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, let, uh... 
if we can, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nalin, if you can answer very briefly, can you please explain whether I am not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly. Oumuamua. Yes. It's an yeah. asteroid or any other kind of object. <laughs> okay. Uh, Oumuamua is definitely an interstellar object. Uh, that means it is not from our solar system. Uh, it came from outside of our, uh, our own solar system because uh, uh, its eccentricity is such that uh, it cannot be, its eccentricity uh, is greater than one. So it came from outside and there was no planet close by. So its orbit could not have been uh, changed and the eccentricity could not have been changed. Uh, so whether it is an asteroid or a comet, uh, that is the question, right? Uh, whether it's an uh, asteroid or any other kind of object, yes. Yeah, uh, exactly what it is, uh, there is some question marks because it shows uh, what are known as non-gravitational forces. Typically, if you take an asteroid or comet, uh, they should move uh, uh, and they, they are influenced by the gravity of other objects in the solar system. But uh, if you take a comet, for example, a comet will outgas and that will have a outgassing force. And those are called non-gravitational forces. So Oumuamua showed uh, a very large amount of non-gravitational forces. And that is why it is a little bit puzzling, but uh, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, it could be consistent with the uh, cometary object, but at the same time, uh, there was no cometary coma. That means coma is the atmosphere of the comet uh, and escaping atmosphere of the comet. Uh, there was no uh, coma, no gas or dust around this object discovered. So it is a puzzle in that sense. Uh, so I think it is not fully resolved, in my opinion, uh, 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 whether it is really a comet or asteroid. But some people have said it is a spacecraft from another civilization, but I would not go that far. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, um, so let me like combine two of the questions uh, from Janaka. Uh, other Surya uh, and Samson Hetiarachi. Uh, so Janaka asked about if the discovery of asteroid using ground-based telescope is one person, what would be the future of using ground-based telescope for this type of research? And what are the possible other resources can be used? Also then the Samson Hetiarachi is asking like, uh, I'm just, Combining this question, like let's say we discovered that kind of thing uh, from the uh, ground-based telescope, but then uh, uh, is there a program to destroy asteroid before they hit that? If they if we found something today, as I uh, recall, okay. uh, Edward Taylor mentioned about this while back. So uh, oh, okay, uh, uh, first um, uh, I the ground not, yeah. I did not say. Uh, uh, ground-based telescopes discover less than 1%. I said uh, uh, sky surveys discover most of the, uh, telescope, uh, the asteroids. Sky surveys are uh, ground-based telescopes. So uh, sky surveys, they scan the sky looking for asteroids. They discover most of the asteroids. Uh, right now, uh, much more than 99%. Uh, and only a few percent can be discovered by non-sky surveys. That means other astronomers, uh, uh, by not other astronomers. So basically, sky surveys are uh, discovering most of them. And all the sky surveys right now, most of them, uh, they are ground-based telescopes. Uh, you may have heard pan stars. 
Catalina, uh, uh, Space Watch, etc. Those are ground-based uh, facilities. Um, and uh, uh, there are uh, 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 space base like uh, uh, WISE and NEOWISE. Uh, uh, NEOWISE is uh, uh, the same spacecraft uh, after uh, some of the uh, coolant has uh, 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 exhausted. Uh, so they look discovered some asteroids too. Uh, that is a, a satellite. And there are plans for discovering satellites uh, specifically for hiding behind the sun, for example. So uh, there are plans for that too. Um, and to answer the second part of the question, uh, are there plans for uh, destroying uh, or mitigating, that is the word uh, used in the community, mitigating asteroid impacts? Uh, yes, there are uh, various techniques discussed. Um, for example, uh, depending on uh, how fast that uh, uh, is, if there is an object uh, which is going to hit Earth, uh, uh, how fast uh, or from uh, whether it is going to hit us in another one year or in another few hundred years, uh, the technique that you had to use would be different. For example, if you uh, uh, paint one side of the asteroid white and the other half uh, black, uh, then um, you can use the thermal forces, different thermal forces uh, to deflect its orbit slowly if the asteroid is going to hit in another thousand years, for example. But uh, if it is going to hit us in a year, then uh, you may have to use the nuclear option. But uh, uh, right now, as far as I know, uh, there is no spacecraft uh, ready to go and destroy an asteroid. But uh, one, one humans have question. the technology. Yeah. One last question, Dr. Samal Singh. I think uh, then we might have to wrap up. Uh, uh, so they did, NASA founded one more new planet called Planet Nine. Can you give a very short answer? Uh, planet Nine has been, or Planet X has been discussed long time, but there are no definite uh, confirmation of any other object. Okay. Um, Actually, and uh, also, uh, if you want me to show the video of uh, how to discover asteroid, I, I can. Uh, it's okay. up to yeah, you. Sure. Sure. Uh, um, okay, let me share the screen. Okay, um, so uh, these are three images taken uh, about one hour apart. And uh, actually we were looking at uh, this object right here, uh, uh, which, which was actually a very inactive comet, uh, but in the same frame, that means uh, you can see another object here. So, so this is an asteroid and a known asteroid actually uh, in this particular case. Uh, so this is one way that uh, somebody can uh, discover an asteroid, but uh, the sky service, for example, uh, they automate this process. So, uh, but they confirm visually later. So, uh, Dr. Nalina, uh, clarification. So the, this is an optical uh, uh, image. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, three optical images, and uh, the white dots are stars or galaxies, whatever. Uh, uh, they do not move 
so we do something called registering. That means basically we put the stars in the same place in the image. So uh, any solar system object, which is moving with respect to the background stars, you can see they are moving. And uh, so this asteroid, uh, you can see my cursor, uh, it's moving as well as uh, this uh, inactive comet. You might not see as a comet, you might see as an asteroid or a star, <laughs> but uh, this is a comet. This is the object that we really were observing, but it happened to be this asteroid was also in the field. And uh, this is not an asteroid, uh, uh, this uh, cosmic trace. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nalain. It, uh, it's very uh, productive, actually. Q&A session was very, very good uh, also. And I think uh, everyone learned a lot. Uh, so, uh, so I'd like to thank you again for the nice talk and uh, answering all the questions from the audience. Um, thank you again uh, for giving this wonderful talk uh, for us as the inaugural talk of the Distinguished Speaker Series. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure. So, uh, so before we move on to the thanking note, of, um, uh, so I'd like to uh, announce a few things. So if you'd like to connect uh, the subcommittee, please write to us at speaker-series at kapsa.org. So we are particularly interested in hearing from you with the topics and speaker suggestions. Uh, so uh, please connect with us with any of your suggestions or, uh, for speakers or topics. And uh, uh, also we'd like to announce our next speakers lineup uh, for the speaker series. Uh, uh, in late May, we are hoping to uh, uh, organize a talk uh, with Professor A.P. De Silva, and then early July, Professor David Hosking, and in August, Dr. Jani Hiti uh, Bandaralage, and uh, September by Dr. Binot De Silva, and oct October by Professor Ranga Dias. And, uh, uh, so uh, uh, to end our event today, so I'd like to cordially invite uh, head of the Department of Physics, University of Colombo, Professor Chandra Jayaratna, to deliver a thanking note. Uh, thank you, Sachit. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a wonderful lecture. I must uh, first uh, thank uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. Nadine Samarsinghe for delivering this uh, wonderful lecture and not only that but uh, he dedicated uh, his discovery to Columbia University as a, as a kind of alma mater that um, the name in the, the asteroid as Colombo uh, in the name of Colombo University, Colombo Unilanka. Uh, so this will be a great, um, I mean everybody should I, I think uh, uh, remember that uh, this kind of uh, uh, gratitudes, uh, particularly uh, the COOPSA members are very helpful and uh, very cordial towards us uh, to the Columbia University because they are all alumni. But you, I know that some, some of the alumni are there, they don't, uh, they don't, they just forget uh, the country. They just forget our university, the school. Uh, but uh, this group is, uh, is uh, remarkable uh, friends and they help us. And this is one kind of uh, one way of uh, tributing to the country and to the university by naming the, this particular discovery. Uh, so Professor Dr. Nalin uh, Samrasinghe, you are also helping us with uh, supervising some uh, PhD programs as well. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much for your uh, a very wonderful lecture and also a very nice question and answer session. Uh, and also, and I know that Nalin has uh, spent a lot of time on, on finding the history of uh, all the people and all the, about the astronomy, but it's a valuable record for the, for the country as well. This, this particular presentation we will record and uh, distribute. And uh, and finally, I would like to thank uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Science and the Dean, uh, Professor Kulsan Nadar, uh, that uh, KUPSA uh, uh, presidents, uh, president, uh, current president, um, Professor Vikram Priya Pereira, 
and uh, the former uh, president, uh, Professor Tilakaratna, uh, uh, Professor L. M. Tilakaratna, as I can remember, uh, he was the former dean of the Faculty of Science. At that time also, we were very good, uh, we had very good cordial relationships. And so uh, I thought that, uh, that we lost him and for, uh, to the university uh, and, uh, and because he was a dean also, but now he is doing a, a better service, I would say, to the university by establishing this, uh, uh, this COPS, COPSA, you would say, and, uh, you know, uh, the services they have done recently uh, is, uh, cannot, uh, you know, uh, measure in dollars, though you say it is 2 lakhs or $250,000 or something. It is, uh, a, I mean, the telescope was one thing that we got and, and school children all over the country are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they are using this uh, telescope uh, for, I mean, we are using it for their education um, and popularization work, and then research work as well in the university. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, I mean, I know that microscopes and various things, one few things I would like to say, two of the things. One is this uh, water coolers that they gave a long time ago, still one, one few are there in the university, one in front of the Department of Physics. All the students are coming there with bottles and filling up water. So it's a meritorious act, I would say. And then, uh, you know, I am in this uh, subcommittee in the student needs in the faculty. And one day a student from uh, Trinco came and asked for, uh, I mean, he said, uh, he has some programs to develop first year students or second year first year student. And his computer, he cannot repair anymore. And uh, so from a very poor family. And then uh, fortunately there was a computer in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, faculty. And, uh, and he came and took it, and that was a computer given by you, a laptop. And then, and that boy was crying, you know, and a, a similar one is the incident is that a girl from uh, Haliala in Badulla uh, said that they are, he, she needs a computer because her uh, tab cannot be used for practical purposes, practical work. And then, uh, so, I asked uh, the dean and the uh, faculty. There was one one left, only one uh, remaining computer laptop, and she came and her mother with and her father lost, and they were they were not having enough food to even to eat, and the clothes were very you know, it's not not to the level of a student, um, but so that is the type of I mean they were all crying and tears come into their eyes when they got this laptop from you. So it is. Uh, so this, I want to say, tell you that you all have done a very worthy course. Thus, uh, I mean, they are for the poor people in the country, uh, and uh, I know that medical equipment and all were much, much more bigger expenses. Uh, but uh, this, uh, I mean, you as uh, Colombo University alumni are doing a great service uh, to the university and to the uh, country. So thank you very much, uh, all, uh, all alumni uh, and Dr. Chandana Gunatilaka several times visited our department uh, to view this telescope and uh, Nalin and Sachit uh, and a lot of uh, our members are there. So thank you all for your contribution to the university. And now you are in the business of delivering knowledge also through this series of lectures. I hope in the future that this lecture series will continue in a, in a, in a better way uh, for our students to get the knowledge. So thank you again. Thank you, Kupsa. Thank you very much, Professor Chandan Jaratna. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to end our event. Uh, and uh, um, so we will see you uh, uh, in a month. So uh, before uh, concluding, if I missed any questions that you put on chat, so I will uh, actually uh, transfer it to uh, Dr. Nalin, so he may able to answer that. And if we, if we have your contact, we will be in touch with you if I missed any questions. So thank you again. Uh, we hope to see you in a month.
with the next talk of the series, uh, hopefully in end of May, and that time, uh, the exact date and time will be announced soon, and the talk will be delivered by Professor A.P. De Silva. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, electricity failure here. Yes, thank you everyone who's joined from uh, Sri Lanka with this all. Uh,